the freight train industry is in Washington's hot seat. This tragedy demands accountability because future derailments will happen. Even one incident can have a, a dramatic impact on a community. We've got to keep working. We've got to continue that drive and that march to zero. Derailments can happen in a variety of places. There's periods of increase and decrease with different railroads from 2011 to 2021. While derailments are on the decline since 2014, just a handful of companies are seeing a surge, most famously. Norfolk Southern. Norfolk Southern. Norfolk Southern. I saw it. I know how it looked. It was scary. I, I've never seen anything like that. I think they would handle it terribly. It was an environmental disaster. This was 100% preventable. It was just the perfect storm of unsafe working conditions gone wild. we got to change the model somehow because the business model has still got a lot of risk to it. How often do trains derail and why? And how can the industry prevent more scenes like East Palestine? At least three Norfolk Southern trains have derailed since East Palestine, but no injuries or spills were reported. Competing railroads like CSX and Union Pacific have had derailments in 2023 as well. Berkshire Hathaway's BNSF saw at least three trains derail in March. In one case, nearly 5,000 gallons of diesel fuel spilled into tribal reservation lands. And trains have continued to derail in April of 2023. Derailments are a common occurrence, and although they've trended downward over the past decade, a small uptick was reported in recent years. There are roughly 1,000 incidents a year, but most occur within a rail yard. Yard movements are more complex, so they're more prone to having these smaller incidents. Most of the accidents that do occur go unreported because the feds don't require any reporting, I think, unless you're up over $8,000. So your statistics might be giving us a false sense of comfort. The crashes have weighed on some of the large freight companies' stock in 2023. If that appears to be getting out of control and a higher risk, well, you better come up with a better, better braking system or more predictive failure analysis, or you might not be chosen anymore. At some point, they're going to say, ah, you're just too risky. Some railroad employees say that corporations have made strategic changes that could be making catastrophic accidents more likely. I started working on the railroad in 1974 at the Chicago Northwestern. Mark Burroughs is a former engineer with decades of experience. I kind of started out in the tail end of what some would consider the, the, the last of the good old days, where we actually had semi-respectable working conditions. The freight industry used to rely on coal, but the coal trade is shrinking. As a result, jobs in the freight industry are on the decline as well. Hiring across all job categories, from yard workers to executives, is on the decline. So to become more competitive? Trains got longer, got heavier. We got on more and more of a barbaric working schedule, uh, attendance policies, and all this was before precision scheduled railroading. In recent years, rail companies have revised their business plans to increase operating efficiency. Some call this technique precision scheduled railroading, or PSR. PSR is a management strategy. And the management strategy is trying to increase efficiency and reduce costs. Precision scheduled railroading was an attempt to take out both capital costs and operating costs. Which entails maximum exploitation of as minimal workers as possible. Probably every class one railroad really runs a different model. Most of the major US railroads have reported using this strategic approach. Norfolk Southern took up the practice in 2019. Overall, operating ratios for all Class 1 railroads, they decreased, which it means there's an increase in profits. The average operating ratio went from 73 in 2011 to 62, and that reflects a net increased revenue about 58% from about 18 billion to 28 billion. One example change from PSR, trains are getting longer. In 2022, we queried the class ones and all the class ones told us they are running longer trains. So for instance, one class one told us that their length of trains had increased 33% from 2011 to 2021. There was also another class one that told us that the percentage of trains that they are running that are over 10,000 feet, which is almost a two mile train, increased from 3% to 25% in 2021. As you're getting two and three mile long trains, 
it's a lot to contend with. Railroads are going to run the length of trains based on their physical infrastructure. In the Midwest, you might have a significantly longer train than if you're in a more uh, dense urban area. Neither the industry, neither the regulator, neither GAO has been able to draw any sort of correlation between safety and train length. In East Palestine, a small crew manned a long train. The lead locomotive had three crew members, including one trainee. There were also 149 rail cars on the train. When you have a trainee with an already skeletal crew, that actually makes it harder. Every time you can take a person out of the cab who's making, you know, $80,000 or more, this is an easy way, relatively easy way, for railroad managers to figure out how to reduce costs. As the industry cuts workers, the government sees a potential safety concern. Before a train departs, you need to have a railroad employee check the train. One of the concerns that we heard was that railroads may have compensated for the reduction in mechanical staff by having other types of staff, like conductors, do those pre-departure checks. And the worry here was that folks like conductors may not have the expertise or the training that your mechanical staff had, and so they may be missing some things, and that could impact safety. The concern for communities are that longer trains might block the grade crossing. If the train is longer, that could create negative effects on the community. We talked to officials in Ohio, and they reported that they have 22 freight trains that travel through their town daily. They have a 16,000 foot train that comes through, which blocks four to five grade crossings at a time. Also, risky pedestrian or motorist behavior, you know, trying to make it across the tracks before a train comes, that can result in fatalities. But the stakes in the freight industry can be much higher. On February 3rd, 2023, in the evening, an eastbound train derailed near the Pennsylvania border. A train derailed, poisoning thousands of people in that town. And the reason that happened was because so many checks and balances that we used to have have been eliminated. Federal investigators point to a faulty bearing on the train. The bearing heat detector, also known as a hot box detector, measures the temperature of bearings as a train goes by. And if a bearing starts to become overheated, it sends an alert to the train with an order to stop the train. When I was running trains, when the hot box detector gave us a robo message over the radio, it was our responsibility to stop, inspect, deal with it, and take whatever corrective action. Now, in the last several years, they have taken that responsibility from the crew. Somebody up in an office, in a desk, is monitoring. 38 rail cars flew off the tracks in the crash. Some were filled with hazardous chemicals. Officials at the site saw the potential for a fire that could burn wildly out of control. The temperatures were rising, it caused our independent expert to become very concerned about the potential for an uncontrolled explosion that would shoot harmful gas and shrapnel into a populated community. So our independent consultant and the Ohio EPA recommended to Unified Command for a controlled burn and a controlled release. The explosion sent chemicals into the air and ground, contaminating nearby waterways, according to a Justice Department complaint. It may move, percolate down into soils and groundwater, which we cannot easily see. There was easy examples of contamination surfaced out in many videos, including our senator, J.D. Vance, where he stirred the stream and suddenly a sheen of uh, that appeared to be an oil or a contaminant showed up. The fact that these chemicals are still seeping in the ground is an insult to the people who live in East Palestine. Those are the challenges that may be hidden in the stream bed or if percolated down through the soils may have created a groundwater plume that are invisible. The environmental calamity could prove dire to residents' health and cast a cloud over the local economy. The company's already been ordered to clean up the site and pay all associated costs. If folks in this community want additional air testing in their home, they'll get it. If folks in this community want additional water testing, they'll get it. Even though there was a very good action done, early on by EPA, but the way it lingered on and impacted the local community, and we still don't know if the environment is clean and restored to its original chemical state. Some of these uh, uh, groundwater cleanup operations may go for a decade. In response to this story, Norfolk Southern said its total number of accidents has dropped, including derailments. 
The company also says it's focusing less on operating ratio moving forward. I think in this case, Norfolk Southern had an opportunity to do a better job of being on top of the situation. They didn't prove their listening and their response to questions that were being asked. And they came in a little late and now they're in catch up mode. And it didn't have to happen that way. People were living next to the rail tracks. The contamination happened next to their homes. So clearly the local community get directly impacted short term because of health hazards and looks like there are long term implications related to their society. It shouldn't take a train derailment for elected officials to put partisanship aside and work together. For now, the industry is making changes ahead of any new rules. The rail industry committed to installing another 1,000 hot box detectors across its network. Again, these are steps that are voluntarily taken because our business understands that safety is key. Rail infrastructure gets relatively high marks in the U.S., but experts believe that there are unknown risks that must be uncovered in the freight sector. FRA has something called risk reduction plans. They're also doing studies like we talked about on employee fatigue. They're doing more looking at blocked crossings. There's a study ongoing on longer trains. Also, they have a braking study that they've been doing for quite a while. They should take a look at their regulations to see if there are gaps related to safety concerns. Experts also believe the industry could use technology to prevent accidents. You could have done a predictive analysis like we do for track failures to say, you got to stop this train. Not because it hit the fail safe minimum, because it's going to hit the fail safe minimum somewhere east of Columbus. Why wasn't that kind of predictive analysis done? And what's the cost because you didn't do it? These regulations could add another headwind for the industry as it fights to stay relevant. If I were the head of the FRA today, there'd be shorter trains, there'd be dignified working conditions at the very minimum. Carmen would have the time they need to properly inspect the cars. There's no room for compromising safety one iota in the rail industry because A, a worker could get injured, maimed, killed, and B, we can have situations like East Palestine.